morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Cockerbrow Morning Show. I'm Cassidy, it's great to be with you again. Cassidy, you seem a bit preoccupied. Cassidy. Uh, well, have you seen the paper today? The New York Times? No. Uh, the Wall Street <laughs> Journal. The Wall Street Journal, no. Uh, the Daily Boar, of course. Ah, yeah, of course, yes. Okay, so listen to this. Uh, In this week's stories I overheard, you know, Nosy Norma's column? Well, it says, this week, while waitressing, I overheard Mrs. Swanson telling Lonesome Ron that she heard Earl Silo telling Officer Gabriel that he heard Cousin John telling Ronnie P. Silage ugh, that sweet swine county citizens were calling him and complaining and couldn't find their way around the online magazine. You know the sweet swine scoop dot com. Sweet well, anyway, swine scoop. It doesn't yeah. get much easier than the sweet swine oh, scoop. Well, com. it gets even better because he completely went and redesigned the whole magazine. Huh. I mean, you've got to see it. There's everything there. It is really? so awesome. Yeah. Like, and the whole story just covers it. It's so... Huh. Well, it, it sounds it mm -hmm. sounds very exciting. Yeah, but, we should uh, look it up. Well, maybe we should bring out our first guest. Oh. What do you think about that? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, hi, you guys. Yeah. It has been such a long time. It has. It's been a long oh time since we've done this. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome all the way from Mount Horeb, Wisconsin, Alwyn Fitzgerald, owner of the Fisher King Winery. <laughs> welcome, Alwyn. Welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's so great that you could be here. Yeah, happy to be here. Well, Mount we're glad Horeb. to have you. Tell us about yeah. Mount Horeb. Well, it's a wonderful little community. It's very tourist oriented, uh -huh. and it's right in south central Wisconsin, about 20 minutes outside of Madison. Okay. And it's actually what their big claim to fame is. They're actually they're known for a number of things, but the big claim to fame is that the troll capital of the U.S. Uh, they have yeah trolls. They have a troll really? way right down the center of town with all these carved trolls hiding in places. So it's that's what their big claim to fame is. Wow, interesting. Kind of an interesting little tie-in with trolls and, and wine. wine. Well, wine. yeah. How does that connect? Well, <laughs> first of all, I want to ask you something before we get too started here. You guys sure. would like a little wine uh, from well, Fisher King Winery? Well, I don't see why not. Would we? Oh, you ever. just happen to have. Glasses. I just happen to have. Yeah. Funny so how that works. A couple of wine glasses always. here. Prepared. This is our biggest tip of the hat to the Trollway in okay. Mount Horeb. Uh, this is Troll Town Red, oh. uh -huh. and it's made from a locally grown grape, Marichal Foch. And it's been a, it just won a double gold medal at the American Wine Society National Competition. Wow. So, it's, it, so it holds its own on a national stage. It's a beautiful, lighter body, dry red, and it's just one of the several that we we uh, make at Fisher King Winery. Wow. So would you like to try a little bit of this? That sure. would be fabulous. You Thank may be you more so white much. drinkers, but I thought maybe you should try the red first. Well, okay. a, oh, especially if it's award winning. I don't see how we could turn, out, turn yep. that away. Thank you so much. Certainly. And speaking of awards. Yes. I happen to spy this bottle over here. Oh yeah. Had a few awards attached to that Yes, there. it does. Look yeah. the surge. There's yeah. a lot of gold and Silver and bronze yeah. there. Looks like it's, can you tell us about this? Sure, that's uh, our, Mar our Marquette wine, and that's made from the Marquette grape, which grows right around here in uh, the upper Midwest. Okay. Ah. It's actually a grape that the, the rights to the grape are owned by the University of Minnesota, um, who has oh, a, the, the, that university has a very active and well-funded viticultural research school. Okay. And they, every few years, they release another new hybrid grape or two that can tolerate our cold climate, our, our freezing cold winters, and uh, produce decent wines. And so this has been a huge medal winner for us all around the country from both wow. coasts, California to New York. That is so fabulous. You know, when you think wine and you think about, how is it? Oh, that's, that's wonderful. You should, you should try it. I am going to, but you know, I've always just, you think about our cold climate and you think about uh, places that produce wine and, and grapes and you think about all these warmer climates and how many, different types of grapes are around there here are in our area. quite a few and it keeps growing every year um, with the number of new hybrids that are getting released from the viticultural schools. Um, one thing I just want to mention before we get too far into this sure. is, do you happen to have that banner over there? There was a banner. I do. Oh yes. Yeah, because uh, you know, that. I was mentioning how this won awards in New York. Um, I'd like to just, if you don't mind, sure I'll just thing. pull this out here. And this is a little bit of hubris if you'll pardon me for just a moment. This is the, the Fisher King Winery. You just pull it off your way now. We were the Wisconsin, the 2015 Wisconsin Winery of the Year. Well, we are. And that was from wow. the New York International Wine Competition, which was held a few months ago in Midtown Manhattan. 
And uh, we had several medals that for our wines that were produced as a result of that. And we're very pleased with the fact that of all the wineries in Wisconsin, we were named the 2015 Wisconsin Winery of the Year. So wow. That, wow. And, and that, I mean, that's nice to us. It's a pat on our back. Yes. But it's also, it speaks to the quality of wines that can come out of wineries that are right here. Uh, in our area that are made, uh, that produce wines from grapes grown right in our area, not just oh, it certainly bringing does. in juice or whatever from California right. or things like that. that so. is, you know what, I can't wait one more second. I've got to try it. Go ahead, because I, I want to talk about this. Looks like another award winner that you yep, have. That is another, that's definitely, that's our most mm. popular white. We call that Blue Rapture. And again, you can tell from all the different medals and whatnot on it that in a number of competitions, most notably on the West Coast, that that has pulled gold, double gold, best in class, a number of accolades that way. Yes. Um, it's a sweeter white, but not over the top sweet. Mm. Um, I kind of, it, it's made from Saval Blanc, which we do bring the grapes and the juice in from New York State. That's where we're getting the Saval from. It can almost grow here in, in Wisconsin and Minnesota, but not quite. If we have an overly cold winter, it'll kill the vines, and so none of the growers are putting it in because it's too risky. Okay. Uh, it produces a wine that's at a, it's a similar flavor profile and certainly a sweetness level that most people think of when they think Riesling. Mm, okay. But it's not a Riesling, it's a different grape. So we've been talking a lot about uh, a lot about wine, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, how did you come up with the name uh, Fisher King yeah. Wine? Well, it's not anything overly profound or deep. Uh, it's just, I guess, uh, all the years I was growing up, I'm a big reader. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm reading most, mostly fiction. And I mean, right now on my nightstand at home, I have like three books going on it simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But when I was younger, I certainly liked uh, some fiction that took place like around the British Isles and it's sort of a, Whatever. Anyway, it's just, and what would happen is every once in a while in one of these books, there would be this character that would show up, the Fisher King. Okay. And it's an uncommon character. It's not like everybody knows all about the Fisher King, mm -hmm. but he's a mythological character. And it just always intrigued me. And every time you'd, you'd suddenly, uh, the Fisher King would appear in one of these fictional books, uh, you'd learn a little something new about the Fisher King. And I just really grooved on it. Um, and for, uh, not that I'm an expert. Not that I'm a, an academic or a scholar in this area, but the Fisher King myth, he's a mythological character, and it, it goes out into two main branches. He appears in Christian myth. He's a, he's a feature in the Grail story. Uh, he's purported to be the, one of the guardians and keepers of the Holy Grail. Oh, okay. ah. And there's a whole, actually it turns out there's a wealth of literature out there on this, you know, of whatever. I have people coming into the winery and quoting citations that I'm supposed to know because I named the winery Fisher For King, sure. but you know, I'm like, oh yeah, oh, Murphy said that, huh? Oh yeah, no, I didn't read Murphy. <laughs> but, um, and then there's a whole nother side of the Fisher King mythology where he's in pagan myth. Oh. And quite frankly, just, I find that a little more interesting and I can kind of sink my fingernails more into it. Uh, he's a good guy. He's sort of an Arthurian character. Okay. Uh, he lives out in the forest. He's a spiritual leader. And uh, there's this inexorable link between the Fisher King and the land and the people. Mm. So if the Fisher King is hale and hearty, then there's happiness and abundance and life is good. But if the Fisher King is weak or he's sickly or he's under attack from his enemies, then there's strife and pestilence and pollution and bad times. Sure. Uh, he's also purported to be at his weakest in the dead of winter and at his most hale and robust at the fullness of summer, oh. like harvest time. Mm. And I just always mm. liked how that ties in with grape growing, yes. you know, dormancy oh, sure. in the winter mm. and, yep. and harvest time in the summertime. Uh, so I just really grooved on the character. And when I was making wine non-commercially for all my life, I would you know, I'd be making 50 gallons at a time in my basement. And when I would jazz up my little fake labels, I would say Fisher King Winery. Yeah. And I just said to myself, if I can ever get my act together and actually open up a bona fide, real commercial winery, well, I'm going to try to name it Fisher King Winery. And so here we are. So far, so sure far no cease and desist orders. Yeah. <laughs> so how many, how many different types of wine do you make? Yeah. Well, it varies, you know, uh, between 10 and 15, 16 wines. Okay. In that sort of range. 
Do you commonly have tours at your winery, or is well, it open to the public? Oh, yeah, it's definitely open to the public. That's what I want to know about. I want to come visit. Yeah, we have a nice tasting room out in the front end with mm -hmm. a tasting counter and tables and nice big windows. We're, uh, we are following the urban winery model, okay. which is sort of different from the conventional model. Conventional wineries are out in the sticks, in the hinterlands. Sure. Uh, the first thing you do is you buy acres and you start planting grapes or you inherit it, but you got to pay a lot of money to plant the grapes and the grape rows and the trellises. Tens of thousands of dollars per acre to do that. Uh, it takes three to four years before you get your first real harvest. So all that time, it's a cash sink. It's an agricultural operation, um, and you, you have to trellis things and prune them and spray them and mulch them and do all this stuff to them. Eventually, you'll start getting some money when the grapes off the field are, are sold to the winery or to another winery. Uh, once you get closer to that point as you've been spending all this money, well, then you're going to pave a nice driveway going in in a parking lot. You're mm. going to erect the glorious chateau and the nice big production area in the back. And it's going to be a combination, you know, manufacturing, retail, agricultural business. And that was a model that we couldn't do because I didn't have a cool three to five million dollars to get that started. Sure. So ours is a little more lean and mean in that sense. There's uh, a little more potential profitability or sooner to become profitable by just focusing on the winery side. So, in, so that eliminates the whole agricultural side. Although I do have my own small vineyard. Uh, basically what we do is we make most of our wine, the majority of our production comes from locally grown Wisconsin grapes. That's really what we're all about and that's our niche. So I have uh, contracts with growers around the state from one end of the state to the other, but all in the southern half of Wisconsin. And that's come harvest time, we bring the grapes in from those folks and they make our wines that are award winning. Now I do, do want to say we do also make some wine from grapes brought in from out of state like uh, the, the Saval Blanc, the, mm -hmm. uh, the Blue Rapture. But head and shoulders above all the rest, our mission is to make delicious, absolutely drinkable, technically well-made wine that come from grapes that are, you know, harvested like, you know, 15 miles away or 30 miles or 50 miles, but it's from right around where our business is located. So are you located right in town there in Mount Horo? Yeah, the urban kind model. Of more of an urban model, so you're right, right in town there, centrally located? Absolutely, we're right on the main street. Okay, oh. I was just kind of looking at the how do I get there, because I'm really thinking, and you're open year round. Yes, we're open year round. In the winter, we do reduce the hours a bit, because okay. it's just not quite as busy. Sure. Right. But in an urban setting, not that Mount Horeb is that urban, but in a population center, right. we, we have the luxury. Some wineries out in the country mm. just close up totally in the winter. Yeah. But we're able to stay open and you know because oh. people come over we also have live music on friday nights oh well, this is just getting wow. better and better Serge. and often on saturdays because we've had so many musicians yeah, that want to keep playing at our place and uh, they need more more days than just fridays provide oh yes yeah. and i see that you've got wines and edibles here in your menu i was yeah. perusing the menu a little bit looking at your edibles whites and yeah yes. they're on the back page there right they has got cheese samplers and there's also some sausage ah. samplers and some side plates. What do you think is kind of your most popular wine or snack that you serve? What well, by far, I mean, like typically right now, the cheese and sausage platter, mm. but we have several different versions of that. Sure. Um, you know, we really, there's a lot of lip service that's paid these days to uh, the buy local movement. Um, but I got to tell you, we really walk the walk of that. We're not just promoting a shop where stuff hanging on the wall could be made in China or something, but we're just a local business. Grapes are grown right nearby. The wine is made by us right there in Mount Horeb behind the tasting room. You can look back through large windows, interior oh, windows, and see our production that? area uh, where we actually make the wine, all the tanks, and when we crush the grapes, the crushers and the press. Whether it's the grapes turning into wine or even the cheese and sausage that we source, it's all from very local sausage makers and cheese companies mm -hmm. so you know people walk in we want them to have the experience with what our the bounty of our uh, yes. local area can provide to them and it looks like chocolate and truffles too yep. Gale ambrosia and truffles they're sold great here. Yeah. you said you grow some of your own i do mm -hmm. yeah i have a small vineyard and then and then you... oh those just get yeah. sucked right into the you know i mean <laughs> it's a drop in the bucket i mean we are literally contract i think this past year i brought in like around fifty thousand pounds of grapes from local growers and then on top of that, we brought in some things from out of state as well. So exactly how did we get started into, into the winery business? Both of my parents are European, off the boat. Uh, my dad just passed this year, 
but he was Irish and my mom is German. And I remember sipping wine at age six at the dinner table oh, and not okay. thinking much. Actually, at age six, I didn't really think much of wine. You know, those delicate little taste buds, right. that, you know. But it was there and it was part of our family culture. A little bit more of that European approach to things. Uh, and then I remember in high school, of all places, I remember going to my mother one day and saying, so what is all this about wine and winemaking and how do you make wine? And in her thick accented, typical Teutonic way, she shook her finger at me and she said, well, go buy a book, <laughs> go, go buy some equipment, go learn how to make wine. So the irony of that is here, here is a mother telling her high school son to go out and make an alcoholic beverage. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that was then and this is now. And I have two teenage kids and I don't talk much about that to them. You know, I'm not, that, it's a different time nowadays. Not out encouraging them to buy books, son. Well, I encourage not them to buy wine. books, but not necessarily to be going out and right. making alcoholic beverages. Yep. But in any event, so that's what got me started. And of course, my standards back then were quite a bit lower than they are now. Um, but it's just kind of it's just kind of an interesting way I got started, yeah. and so then I went off and got a biology degree, and I all the time I, I did a little stint for a few years, like when I went to college, I got into beer making because yeah. it's a faster, cheaper, easier in some ways. I don't want to offend any brewmasters out there, but I sometimes I think that uh, beer is a little more forgiving that you can have some flaws with a beer, but the beer is still drinkable. Mm -hmm. But I personally. I find that when there's a flaw with a wine, it's right there for everyone to notice. Yeah. So I find it less forgiving. And it be, so after I got out of college, it became more of a challenge, I felt, for me personally. And you know, so I started taking more winemaking courses. I got involved in the UC Davis certificate program in wine production, uh, you know, Michigan State, down in Illinois, various things. And you know, I continued to make wine at home and learn, and I went out and hobnobbed with winemakers, and I worked at some wineries a little bit. Wow. And all those years, all between the biology degree and then I, had a, I got an MBA, I worked for 35 plus years for corporate America, uh -huh. typically in a science or technology-based business. Oh, and with all that education, I'm sure you did for yeah, a while. <laughs> but it was like, you know, it's kind of like that country western song, is that all there is, my friends? After 35 or so years, I was just getting more and more disillusioned. This wasn't where your heart was. Right. It wasn't a passion. You had right. to build up your enthusiasm to market products and services for these companies. There was nothing wrong with any of them, but it just didn't, it wasn't tripping my trigger. Sure. And I got kind of tired of keeping the boss happy and playing yep. company politics mm -hmm. and dealing with egos well, we and agendas. Like, oh, right? yeah. 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 So I finally said, you know, I got in my 50s and I said, I've been talking about this winery. I've been dreaming about opening a winery, thinking about it. It's like, if I don't do it now, it's going to be a lot harder in my 60s. And it ain't happening in my 70s. Mm. So, you know, as we all march along, we're all subject to this same phenomena. We see that timeline start compressing. Mm -hmm. There's not a damn thing you can do about it. Right. I mean, I, no one's figured it out as far as I know. Yeah. But I said, if I'm going to do this, I better do it now. So basically what I did was I walked away from corporate America rolled my entire 401k of 35 years work for other people into this venture wow. and we've been off and running since 2011 uh four, four plus went years for it, huh? just went for it yeah well, and you. right now we're almost profitable <laughs> well you've done obviously you've done yeah. very well with well we're you know we st it, it, it's, it takes a lot of money up front oh yeah and so you, we whittled that giant loss you know from the beginning yes. down as sales go up and we're controlling costs and i think next year we're with I believe we're fortunate that we're, we probably will turn that corner sure. and then hopefully start going the opposite right. direction. So that's, that's the goal. That's How many <laughs> pounds of grapes does it take to make one bottle of wine? Oh, I wish you had given me a heads up on that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think in terms of tons of grapes off the field, how sure. many tons per acre, and how many gallons of finished wine does that produce? So, I mean, the rough calculation, it really varies a lot. Uh -huh. I'm like, kind of like being an economist, you know, it depends. Yeah. But there's a wide variation sure. between yeah, reds and whites and be, things yeah. like that. But in this part of the country, typically, if you can get four tons of grapes off an acre, that's probably a good number. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but it takes a lot of grapes to make a relatively small amount of wine. Uh. So for example, one ton will probably in the end produce approximately 130 to 160 or 70 gallons of finished yeah. wine. Okay. 
So if you really are going to be putting out tens of thousands of gallons, you really need a lot of tons of grapes. Right. Oh, yeah. So, um, and you, That's great. And do you have a, a website? Yes, I have a website. But before I mention the website, I want to mention that we also have one of the things I wanted to do at the very beginning, especially when we were pulling together the, the proper funding to get Fisher King Winery off the ground, is uh, I, I wanted to do this also. I wanted to get the local people from the local area engaged mm -hmm. in our winery yeah. and to feel like it's their winery too, not just my venture. And so we had, uh, we've had now three equity offerings in the winery. Oh. And so uh, we have approximately 37 small, mostly area investors who ha have come on board and have bought some equity in the company, provided some cash. And that's between that and my own funds and some other sources, that's what allowed us to get going. So I want to give a shout out to those guys because oh, they helped make Fisher sure. King Winery yes. the entity that it is today and with a, a bright future. All right. So now the website, yeah, it's fisherkingwinery.com. And uh, you can go there and we post things online. Uh, you'll, you can read about our story. You can read about our wines. Great. We have a commerce page there so you can order some of our wines. Ooh, uh, we don't ship to every that. state in the union, but quite a few of them. Um, and then actually even more important these days is we have a very robust Facebook pre presence. Oh, okay. So um, that's where we, it's so easy to just Oh, send yeah. out announcements, new releases, anything like that. So if people go to our Facebook page and like us, anytime we make an announcement about a new wine or some new event going on at the winery, that, that you'll be the first ones to see right it. Right there on my news feed. Right. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's facebook.com uh, slash Fisher King Winery. Uh, well, I see we're getting the wrap up. Oh, signal. no, but I see that he brought some more wine bottles. So oh, we should look at those. Oh, let's take sure. a look. Yeah. You let's would notice that, yeah. wouldn't you? I did you? notice. I just am very observant that way well um, let's what? see i got uh, lots of other wines here but again most of them Ooh. are made from wisconsin grown grapes ah. white this is whisper. white whisper yeah. white nice whisper sweet. see that's that. what i like well that's what we named it but the, i'm semi-sweet the grape that's in oh, there well, is uh, oh frontenac gris out. related i mentioned mm -hmm. earlier frontenac with the marquette and that's related to frontenac yes. and that's a that is the rights to that grape the okay. production of it is from the university of minnesota uh. that makes a beautiful earthy white wine mm -hmm. and that one's a little sweeter. Okay. We have uh, St. Pepin. The St. Pepin grape is another Wisconsin grape, oh, okay. a local yeah. grape. Um, that is a is varietal that was pr too? created by the upper Saint Midwest's Pepin. own Mendel of the Vineyard years ago. Uh, Very nice. Yes. Elmer Svensson. Talk about a Wisconsin name or a Minnesota, yeah, really, a Minnesota yeah, name. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, Elmer Svensson was like our own little Mendel of the Vineyard. <laughs> and he crossed, he came up with a number of cold hardy hybrid grapes before it, almost anybody was really doing that. Um, cool. We also have other products like Gentle Sin, Ooh. which is a nice medium sweet. That one's for you. That's a good Yes, deck. it should be. <laughs> that, that's a great deck wine, a summertime <laughs> wine. Ah. We do have a Riesling. Obviously, these ah. grapes were not grown here because oh, Riesling really cannot tolerate ones. our cold winters. Too sweet for yes. the cold winters here. And then uh, a Chardonnay. A Chardonnay, got the dry. I'm going to just quickly rattle through all these. I mean, we have more no, back at the great. winery. We're also going to be releasing a new blueberry oh, wine too. soon. Really? Yeah. This is uh, Breakneck Red. Those grapes mm. are grown in Illinois. That's the Chambersin grape. And you actually, one of my absolute favorites, it's, it's not right necessarily for everyone. Uh, because you have to like a dessert wine. Oh, okay. But this is our version of a port. We call mm. it Perfection. And it's made from Frontenac. That, again, going back to that core grape that we talked about. And this is absolutely, this is, it has brandy in it, so it's got a little extra oomph. Oh, sure. Okay. But in, in front of a fire or something on a cool evening, this goes great with dark chocolate. Oh my goodness. Or even like a stronger, like a creamy blue cheese or Roquefort or oh. something. Ah. The two, uh, in different ways, they do a nice handshake mm. with it. So I would strongly encourage you to try this on a cold try upper Midwest perfection. evening. Try mm. yeah. It's looking kind of good. Okay, well, I suppose so we don't get in trouble. Well, here, I think <laughs> you guys, your glasses are empty. Oh, What's well. going on? <laughs> Mind if yes. I do hear you told me Diego. before we even started, you were really interested in sipping some wine today. I really am interested. Thank you so much. And if you don't mind, I think I'll have a little of, uh, of fruits of my some. own labor. Yes. I think, I think we should toast. Well, well, here's to you guys. Thank you. Thank yes, you, Alan. It's been a great show. It has been a great show. One of my show. favorites. And I want to thank all of you folks for coming and watching the Cockleburn Morning Show and our viewers out there, too, where we weed out the big stories throughout Sweet Swine County and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.